hear here. It's really encouraging when you hear the voices of women, not just the voice, but with a lot of power and passion in whatever they present. That's what I noted. So first of all, may I congratulate Ekima University College uh, on your 40th anniversary. I believe that when the college started way back in 1984, theological courses were largely a preserve of the men. And the African women voices at that time perhaps did not carry as much weight. But today, as we celebrate 40th anniversary, Hekima University College chose the theme, African Women Theologians and Synodality. It is a testimony of an intentional transformative journey the college made, as well as the recognition of the unique and diverse contribution that African women theologians in a spirit of synodality can bring to the theological discourse. I really appreciate uh, this journey. And Kima chose the right path way back before the conversation about synodality in the church. What is unique, and this is really what I, I, I'm trying to emphasize in these few lines, is that an engagement with women is in fact, is is the fact that women not only bring the knowledge, but they bring also the praxis that stem from the heart. <clears throat> that is the uniqueness. Any conversation with women is not only the knowledge, but the practice, the praxis, and that which comes from the heart. And this is very, very important for the spirit of synodality. The conference is timely as it presents a platform to listen to African women theologians as unique members of the church in order to understand a new and in a deeper way how God might be speaking to us today. In the Old Testament, we hear of great women, the mother of Samuel, because theology being the study of God's revelation of himself, in the scripture, Hannah's theology in the Old Testament, for example, was born in her battle with infertility and the painful humiliation of Lincoln. It helped her to delve deeply into the mystery of God in her human experience. Hebrew scholars recognize her as a theologian of the monarchy because her theology shows up in King David's writings, presumably as the intermediator. I mean the son, her son, Samuel, was the intermediator, mentor, a prophet, and a judge in Israel. You could get this from 1 Samuel chapter 2, 1 to 11, and 2 Samuel chapter 22. Father, we see deep theological insights from the New Testament women, Mary of Bethany, was the first great New Testament theologian. She was the first of Jesus' followers to embrace and support his mission. I don't mean to really exclude men, but while the male disciples were in denial, Mary, in her feminine endowment, entered into his isolation, the isolation of Jesus, the passion of Jesus, and affirmed his cause. <clears throat> and Jesus said, she has done a beautiful thing to me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for battle. A great woman, using a feminine endowment to be able to enter into the passion of Christ, the suffering of Christ, and be able to do such a noble thing in front of many men and women, of course. In the contemporary world, one writer had the following to say, women hold on to their faith more heartily, work harder for the church, and in general practice with more consistency than men. These are the words of George, an American pioneer of the surveyed something. All of us, we are researchers, and I believe that you come across uh, such uh, truths. 
what can what can we draw from these examples and what can African women theologians tap into and leverage on from the modern experiences of women in order to contribute to the process of synodality. Therefore, your theological studies, which I was privileged to listen to this morning and what you've been sharing for these past few days, dear theologians, women theologians, prepare you to sit at the table as equals, connect and make a contribution to the theological discourse, especially during this time when we are talking about synodality. This is an encouragement and a challenge to African women theologians to engage with their own experiences, amplify your unique voices for a deeper enrichment and understanding of God. When your voice is not heard, the world misses out. The child misses out too. And therefore the challenge is for women African theologians to become more visible. Finally, I want to commend Yakima University College for bringing together African women theologians to share their knowledge and experiences. It is a great conversation that we need to keep advancing. As an institution, you are celebrated milestones and have made a great contribution to the church. The sisters in Kenya have been great beneficiaries and we sincerely appreciate our partnership with Ekima University College. My parting shot, shape the narrative. It is not about one gender against the other, but it is all of us listening to the spirit and journeying together. Let us build a church that leverage on diversity and inclusivity. To our African women theologians, I celebrate you. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you so much, Sister Keino. Another round of applause for her. Okay, so we are moving on to the next session, and this is this will be three presentations. I remind the presenters that they have 20 minutes. Um, I have my able timekeeper here, Ms. Vincentia. So she's not here to threaten you, but just to give you a polite reminder when you're behind time. So I'm going to call upon our first presenter, who is Sister Audrey Ngao Mwale. Sister Mwale is a religious sister of the congregation of the little servant, servant sisters of the Blessed Virgin Mary Conceived Immaculate. Sister Mwale holds a master's degree in sacred theology from St. John Paul Catholic University of Lubin in Poland. She also holds a master's um, sorry. Her master's dissertation was titled Exegetical and Theological Interpretations of Symbols in Revelation 12. She has additionally taught English and introduction to the New Testament at St. Paul Richard University College. Currently, Sister Mwale serves as an administrative assistant in the Zambia Conference of Catholic Bishops, and also as a visiting lecturer at St. Dominic's Major Seminary, where she offers courses in New Testament and Pauline literature. Additionally, she shares a series of short commentaries or write-ups on women in the Bible on social media platforms, and it is my hope she can also share this so that we can also be able to, to enjoy her write-ups. So on this note, I welcome Sister Male. Please welcome her with a round of applause. Good morning to you all. Um, I'll start by also uh, showing the gratitude, expressing my sincere gratitude for the organizing team for the invitation and for all those who sponsored it. Thank you very much. I am very excited about coming here 
because it seems to be my first time to uh, come to such a gathering. Uh, as you have heard, I normally sit in the office and write whatever is supposed to be written by the bishops. And I sit in their meetings, they come four times in a year, and I'm a recording secretary, though I have no word, but I record whatever is happening. <laughs> so that is my main duty. Uh, then out of interest or love of uh, scripture, I go to teach because, you know, I started everything in Polish language. So I thought, if I don't go out to teach, then it will be buried. I saw, um, I heard they were saying that uh, some, in some countries there are a lot of theologians, but when they come back, they don't see them. That's the situation in Zambia. Uh, they are countable. I can even count them, the Catholic uh, women theologians, and there is no association as I was hearing. So there is no meeting and sharing uh, or upgrading or renewing. There is nothing like that. And all those that have come back from studies, the few have uh, given some other responsibilities. And they don't. I'm the only one uh, going to the seminary to teach. Uh, the only a religious sister, but there's an elderly lady teaching English in that seminary. Uh, so uh, we are still a while to go. Uh, when I was hearing, I was encouraged to say, uh, how I wish in Zambia we could have such a, uh, a setup that they did in uh, they are even associations or something to do with that. So um, this is the title, A Theological Reflection on Women as Witnesses to Those at the Peripheries of the World. And I citing, I'm citing John and uh, Luke. I will not go around, but uh, for the resurrection story that I'm quoting, I'm only uh, citing a John and Bill. So this is my overview. Uh, I intend, if I manage to talk about the Bilidon theology for uh, teaching on women, then women as witnesses, as I said, from Luke 24 and John 20, uh, African religious women as witnesses to those on the peripheries, and then selected African women saints as witnesses to those on the peripheries. This seems to be uh, a lot, so I'll try to be passing some slides so that I manage. So as women, we often feel inadequate at times, frustrated, incapable in our efforts to be good religious, wives, mothers, sisters, grandmothers, or friends to those whom God has entrusted to our care, wife. However, the consolation, I will explain why later, the consolation uh, for the said confusion is that God still speaks to humankind, and in particular to women, as he had done before to the women of the Bible and the other women, holy women or saints. Therefore, it's time for women to break out their shells to find God-given purpose on the peripheries of the world. In my um, presentation, I'll really be underlining that um, women should uh, come out of their shells or maybe feel proud in the skin of being a woman because sometimes in, we feel inferior just because uh, of uh, this that is surrounding us, the tradition, uh, the history, and we feel inferior already we are threatened. So I am trying to say we come out of our shells as women, not imitating men, you know, uh, sometimes we feel proud even to do those responsibilities that men are doing, like maybe driving a very big truck or being even a, a police officer. Somebody was commenting to say the police officers that are women, police officers are very strict uh, to the sense that they make everything difficult. To some extent it's true, 
But why do they do that? I feel it's that inferiority complex that we have to say, now, here I am, I can do it. Uh, let me reduce on talking because otherwise I'll be. The challenge of women is <laughs> to reach out, to love without measure, to invite and make the truth accessible. Women have got to tend to those in need. It's just natural and enter into the pain and with compassion, joy, and tenderness, show them the world. Then they will know who they truly are and who they are destined to be. Jesus himself broke down the cultural barriers that we know. He valued women and treated them with dignity. To share the theological reflection on women witnessing to those on the peripheries, this presentation possesses and draws evidence from the role played by women in the resurrection story. The most incredible event in the history and the absolute foundation of the Christian faith. We shall then further acknowledge the saintly lives of all selected African women who were once marginalized and yet became a source of joy to others. They became the true witness to those on the peripheries. Indeed, this despised and weak gender was commissioned through the resurrection story to bring hope where there was none and to bring light into the night of the disciples. They were called to be witnesses of Jesus' resurrection and to announce to those on the peripheries. This is my introductory part. So now I go to just a little bit about the biblical and theological teaching of which also the word is here was uh, said in, in passing, uh, uh, just like this one, uh, I already heard it. The theological reflection of humanity is that human beings were created in the image of God. Male and female, he created them. But I'll not dwell in explaining uh, so much the details uh, about this, but this is the theological backing that is in Genesis. I've taken, uh, you know, the two creation stories, I took only this, this one. So nevertheless, scripture itself is more inclined to the tradition and customs of that time. So even if we have uh, these uh, um, theological uh, reflections or texts that talk about uh, valuing a woman, uh, but we have all those that also show something very negative. Like uh, when you read in Genesis 19, 6 to 18, I'll tell that depersonalizing, you know, you find the story of Lord offering his daughters to be done right. It's a very sad story. The next one is in the same manner that this Levite concubine was done right uh, the whole night. And the next morning, the body was divided in 12 parts and shared among the Israelites. Go and read this story, you find it. But I just wanted to give an example of those texts that uh, maybe they even live out in the text for children because they are too sharp, too strong. So such things you can find in the Bible where women were really uh, put uh, to that lower place. However, not everything in scripture is normative. In other words, just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean it's allowed. Polygamy isn't justified by Deborah's narrative. Murder isn't justified by Moses' uh, actions. Uh, the mention of slavery isn't, it's just it's justification in Pauline letters. So I will not go in details, but uh, I just wanted to bring out that point. These narratives are contextually admonitions, not licenses that you are allowed to have 12 wives. No, because you know they'll quote the Bible and tell you that this is allowed in the Bible. <laughs> Despite being limited, often more evidence, even in the Bible itself, they were limited, women were limited, but despite that, they showed these attractive personalities. And each of them has a lesson to offer to the rest of humanity. 
and especially to the men folk. Each of them show humanity as an example of life to understand, to imitate, or maybe to avoid, depending on the situation. So uh, I go to this text that I am um, uh, reflecting on. To the modern world, a witness may be explaining what a witness is. Uh, let me rush through. Uh, you know what it is to be witness. Maybe I start from here. In Jewish law, as a rule, only two free Jewish uh, men could be witnesses. You refer to John. And yet the resurrection story was told by a woman. We would have expected one or more of the apostles to, to, to bring it out. Or if a, a woman, at least the mother of Jesus. But here we are talking of Mary Magdalene. And of course, we, we have uh, a debatable thing on the who is this Mary Magdalene and so forth. But uh, it is this sometimes associated to this person who had demons. But that is debatable. Nevertheless, it's Mary Magdalene who was the first person to uh, own a record to, to see the risen Jesus after saving other disciples. Christ's death on the cross for sins has no saving significance without the resurrection. Indeed, the resurrection is the climax of the gospel account, and the women were the, oh, the first privileged to say the words, I have seen them, and not a man. Mary first post resurrection responsibility and privilege was to give witness to those on the peripheries, and her mission was go tell my brothers what you have just what has just happened and what was yet to happen. Brothers are to be told that Jesus is ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God, which means that Jesus' father and God is now there as well, some kind of adoption there. Huh. So I don't know, maybe I don't know. The objective of this presentation of women as witnesses to those of the peripherals of the world took into consideration, especially the example of Luke, as I said. Um, however, throughout the mystery of Jesus, uh, let me start from the second, from the Lucan account, we learn that the women accompanied and supported the itinerary ministry of Jesus. Luke grounds this insistence on the importance of the role of women's apostles and mission in the church life, in their commission to be first proclaimers of Easter faith. According to Luke, they also told of what they witnessed and understood, even being before being commissioned. In John, there is something interesting about the uh, symbolism of darkness. The scene opens on a solitary figure walking through the darkness. The evangelist may have added darkness to incorporate the scene into the light symbolism of the gospel. The power of darkness gives way to the light of the dawn of Jesus' victory. These women courageously and with passion rushed to the tomb and became witnesses to the empty tomb. They were the first to be sent to the peripheries of the Jewish society where there was fear, hatred, and they transformed the darkness of death into redeeming light and echoed the beginning of every salvation story. I have seen the Lord. Mary has seen the resurrected Jesus, has been commissioned by, his, by him to serve as a saint one. Indeed, the lives of those who saw Jesus after the resurrection were changed. The hopelessness they experienced after their crucifixion was turned into joy as a result of encountering the risen Jesus. Meanwhile, we are all called to be bearers of good news in a dark and troubled world. The truth of the matter is that there are still women witnesses to the resurrection. Like the first women of the tomb on Easter morning, most women have beheld cruelty brutality and despair. This is still happening. They have also been gifted with the vision of triumph and transformation. Don't forget about that. And they have been compelled by the commissioning to share the precious vision with others. This is our task. This 
one I'll skip. We have talked about a lot of about African, whatever we are doing, uh, how we are. But the synod uh, also is emphasizing something there. The synod on synodality document described the peripheral role. Maybe I didn't define it, but uh, I got this definition from these you know, the papers. Played by the shed as a growing issue that impacted the function of the clergy and how power is exercised in the <clears throat> historical uh, male-led institution. The synod on synodality draw the attention not just of Catholics, but women everywhere putting the question of female leadership in the church and beyond in the spotlight. Each woman is called by God to participate in the mission of the church and to God's love for all people. She may fulfill this mission in a variety of ways. One of those ways is through the consecrated life. Uh, consecration, consecrated women are called to communicate a significant message in the modern world. As beautiful as their witness is, it's equally important to celebrate and take inspiration from those around us who are not yet saints, but have made brave choices and are trying to live their lives in a way that makes the new evangelization a reality for all of us. The Pope also uses the term periphery to mean those who are marginalized by society the poor, the homeless, the mentally disturbed, the refugee, and the immigrant. So I skip this. Uh, for the examples, since uh, um, I have little time remaining, for the examples, I took uh, Bakita as one of the African saints. She was indeed an African flower. Um, Bakita remained a true witness of love. You know, Bakita's story is now very common, I mean, very well known because of human trafficking that has come about. So she's one of the examples that I took. I'll not be reading everything. The other example is St. Monica, an African as well, who prayed for her son and the husband. Ooh. Monica's journey of faith continues to be a model as an inspiration of many Christian mothers who have to cope with their wayward and dis dis dissolved children. Uh, the other one is the saint that we just celebrated a few days ago, Perpetual and the maid. They bore witness to their savior with their own lives. Perpetual and Felicity's martyrdom still instill hope in those on the peripheries of the world. Ah, the conclusion I get is that then, ah, no, this one is really summarized. This one. Our challenge as women is to reach out, to love without measure, to invite and make true, truth accessible. We've got to tend to those in need and enter, enter into their pain and with compassion, console them with the word of the Lord, joy and tenderness. Then we will know where we are, by whom we are created, what it means to exist, who we are truly are, and who are destined to be. We will know that our mission is larger than what many have been made to believe and accept in this history that uh, we have. Thank you for your attention. Another round of applause for Sister Mother for that beautiful presentation. Our next presenter is Sister Karin Tala Tonke. Sister Karin is a native of Cameroon and a missionary sister of the Immaculate Heart of Mary. She holds a master's in biblical theology from the Catholic University of Congo. Currently, she is a doctorate student at the Catholic University of Central Africa. 
In addition to her studies, Karin is a community leader as well as an animator. She is also involved in initiatives that support women education, entrepreneurship, and leadership development. Kindly welcome, Sister Karin. Good morning, all. Good morning. I would like to start by expressing my gratitude to all those who made this gathering possible. Thank you for the invitation. And thank you for giving us the opportunity to share with other people, with other women interested in theology in Africa. I want to thank those who spoke before us. Since Thursday, we have felt the interrelatedness and the complementarity of our sharing. And before I begin with my topic, I would like to go back to something Sister Oso said, Osho. She said, the men prayed, thank you, Lord, that I am not a woman. And I think this is something that we have to look at. Why did the people, why did they think that women were not important and men can be like women? Yesterday, Sister Beliwe also shared much of what I'm going to be talking about today. So that makes my paper more simple because you have the material already. So the topic, the title of my paper is The Healing of a Crippled Woman in Luke 13, 10 to 17 a paradigm for safeguarding vulnerable women in Africa. The gospel, the gospel of Luke stands out as one with a very special interest in the oppressed and outcast of society. Citing the prophet Isaiah, Jesus expresses his preferential option for the poor in these terms. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim a, a year of God's favor. The story of the healing of the woman bent over or the crippled woman in Luke 13, 10 to 17, falls in this context of liberation and it is proper to look. Our African context is still plagued with different forms of oppression, especially the oppression of women. We saw that already during the past days. Conscious of the need to protect and safeguard vulnerable people and vulnerable women in our society, our interest in this paper is to explore through a simplified narrative analysis the dynamics within the story with the hope of discovering how Jesus' action could inspire our efforts towards healing and liberation. The paper is divided into five parts. First, text and context of Luke 13, 10 to, 10 to 17. The narrative coherence and structure, a close reading of Luke 13, 10 to 17, the characterization and mirroring of our African society, Jesus' action as a paradigm for safeguarding vulnerable women in Africa. About the text and context, Luke 13, 10 to 17 is an episode Within the, con within, within the central section of Luke's Gospel, chapter 9, verse 51 to, na to 19, 40, uh, verse 44, which consists of the journey to Jerusalem, and it focuses on Jesus' teachings and discussions with opponents. It is a miracle story wherein Jesus heals a crippled woman and this culminates in a Sabbath controversy provoked by the healing. The story constitutes a literary unit 
which distinguishes itself in terms of time, setting, and characters from what went before and what comes after. Here we see that Jesus is in the synagogue on the Sabbath, and there are three main characters. He is teaching. Previously, he had been on a journey. He's teaching, and we have three characters, mainly Jesus, the woman, and the Pharisee, and the, sorry, the synagogue leader. And also, it's about healing. In the end, we see a crowd rejoicing. And what comes after? We have two parables. So we are taking this as a literary unit. The narrative coherence and structure. Some scholars have identified this as a harmonious diptych structure that unifies two panels comprising a healing story and the controversy. In each panel, someone gets Jesus's attention and Jesus says or does something that leads to a twofold result. Another scholar, Joel Green, his, in his structure, he identifies a series of responses triggered by Jesus' healing action. The response of the woman, the response of the ruler, and the response of the crowd. In the context of narrative criticism, we identify a macro structure withholding two intertwined plots. Thus, verses 10 to 13, constitute a subplot with an independent storyline centered on the healing of the woman or the healing encounter of Jesus with the woman. And this first plot is the initial situation of the second plot. I will show the plots. So in the subplot, which is the encounter with the woman, we have the presentation of Jesus and of the woman. Then the complication is the woman's ailment, which is described. And there is a liberating encounter between Jesus and the woman. The resolution is the healing of the woman from her ailment. And the final situation is the praise. The second plot, the main plot, starts with the initial situation, which is the healing of the woman, what we just saw on the previous slide. The complication is the intervention of the synagogue leader, which we, we term as arrogance of the leader. The transformative action is Jesus' unveiling of the hypocrisy of the leader and the triumph, there is a mistake on triumph, the triumph of human dignity. And the resolution and final situation show how the leader is put to shame or is shamed or humiliated, and the crowd alongside the woman glorifying God. In the encounter, in a close reading, we are already on the third part, the encounter with the woman, we see the presentation of Jesus and the woman. It is against the backdrop of the synagogue and of the Sabbath, Situating this in a religious context, the two main characters are presenting. When Jesus are presented, when Jesus is teaching, he perceives a woman. And we see this that the, the narrator zooms, zooms on the appearance of the woman, and nothing is said about her motivation. Why did she come to the synagogue? It is not said that she came to ask to seek healing, and she says nothing. We don't know why she's in the synagogue. We presume that she came to pray like the others on the Sabbath. Sorry. The woman's ailment is the complication. The narrator elaborately describes the woman's ailment. She has an infirmity which has lasted for 18 years. She's bent over and cannot stand up straight. Each description builds on the former and brings to light the greatness of her affliction. Her physical posture denotes extreme tension 
suffering and pain, portraying her as a woman in distress and of low social rank. Her condition of physical limitation calls for concern. Will Jesus do something? Or will he ease her pain? Here the reader is held in a suspense. When Jesus sees her, he calls her to him. This is the liberating encounter. He talks to her. He declares that she is free from her infirmity. He lays his hands on her and heals her. As a good observer, Jesus perceives, judges, and acts accordingly. This is the climax as Jesus reaches out to her. The progressive action in this scene has a slow rhythm. The narrator portrays what Jesus does in different stages. The woman has become the center of attention and each gesture of Jesus shows his genuine concern. When he says to her, woman, you are free from your sickness and lays his hands on her, the story develops in another direction as the woman experiences liberation. The woman regains wholeness in the resolution. This is a reversal of situation. She goes from brokenness to wholeness. And because of that, she glorifies God. Her praise goes beyond Jesus to God, her maker. And we go faster, I have just 10 minutes. The second, the second encounter, which is the main plot of our story, is the encounter with the synagogue leader. The healing is what we just heard about. Talking about the complication, which is the arrogance of the leader, we see that the leader objects his, he, sorry, the synagogue leader's objection provokes a crisis. He has a sense of his own importance that shows it, itself in a proud and insulting way. His attitude and admonition are in sharp contrast with the joy of the woman. While she rejoices, he is angry. Revealing the inner view of the leader, the narrator points his indignation towards Jesus. But instead of talking directly to Jesus, he addresses the crowd. He avoids talking to the woman. It seems as if, if he talks to the woman, he will be bringing out her worth. But the woman is invisible in his eyes. When Jesus talks to the man here, this is the transformative action. Jesus starts by calling him hypocrite, and not only him, but himself and his allies. They are hypocrites because they don't practice actually what they preach or they show, they portray something else, but the practice, they do the opposite. So Jesus confronts him and exposes his hypocrisy and indifference to human suffering. This woman has been suffering for 18 years, but Jesus says, uh, the, the synagogue leader says, she cannot be healed on the Sabbath. Here, I will not talk about the narrative devices, but I will just pick up the uh, classic structure, the classic, where the woman is put in the center. Jesus, Jesus makes an important point. He openly and fearlessly confronts this leader. And he puts in the rhetoric questions that he asks, he uses the verb to lose, portraying a semantic field of freedom. He wants to free the woman. And we see the verb to lose at least three times in this, we saw it in verse 12, and in this part of the transformative action. Jesus uses contrast. He has called the the synagogue leader, a hypocrite. He would call the woman a daughter of Abraham. While the hypocrites 
untie the animals from the stall on the Sabbath, an animal that has been tied only for one day, which is a material bond that has to be loosed, and they see it, even though they say there is no necessity of working. Jesus sees the woman as a daughter of Abraham, who has to be untied from Satan's bond. She has been in that bond for 18 years. It is a spiritual bond that has to be loosed, and he talks of the necessity of healing the woman, and he heals her. And Jesus emphasizes her dignity as a child of God. He refers to her as a daughter of a daughter of Abraham, an expression which, which is reserved for people in need of God's mercy, persons defined by others as existing outside the boundaries of God's chosen, yet the very people to whom God shows his fidelity and brings salvation. By using this title, Jesus implies that she's worthy of his concern and healing and any, as any Jewish man and has a full claim to her religious heritage as any other person. So she is a subject in her own right. She's worthy of his concern. So in the resolution, the resolution and the final situation, we see that the arrogance are put to shame. The there is an instance of situational irony because the leader who was accusing has become the accused and the woman has been freed. There is a joy of salvation. The crowd rejoices at the wonderful deeds of God, namely the healing and liberation of this woman whose dignity gives the, her the privilege of being healed on the Sabbath. Characterization and mirroring. The woman bent over, mirroring the oppression of African, of the African woman. Initially, initially, the narrator character characterizes the unnamed woman. Well, she's nameless and crippled. She's of a lowly posture, but she's attended to by Jesus, as we have seen and ignored by the synagogue leader who is insensitive to her suffering. And Jesus upholds her and shows her dignity as the daughter of Abraham. Mirroring her with the African society. We see, we look at the oppression of African women. Afri there is social, economic, and religious oppression as an impact of systematic discrimination, patriarchy, and clericalism. Women are deprived of basic needs in various parts of Africa and treated as objects. We have access to basic needs, health, education, and you can name the rest, we have been talking about them. We have examples of young girls forced into marriage, given by their parents, and recently in Congo we have Pastor Pasambaka, I think that's the name, who gave his 15-year-old daughter to a pastor in marriage, given by her own father. So we have gender-based violence with all it entails. Uh, there are a few examples, breast ironing, female genital mutilation, which still continue. We have gender-based based discrimination in the family and in the church. Cultural practices that accentuate the marginalization of women, oppression of women, by other women that unfortunately happens to. So as for the arrogant synagogue leader, we see, we have seen who he is, but today some patriarchal traditions and cultural norms remain oppressive and limit the empowerment of and protection of women, just as the leader did. And we are landing. <laughs> I think I have two minutes. <laughs> Jesus as a paradigm. Jesus is liberating action as a paradigm for safeguarding the vulnerable women in Africa. There is an invitation to the synodal church. We are in the context of African women and synodality. So given that safeguarding is a justice issue and we all have a shared responsibility of seeking justice, for those who are marginalized, excluded, or suffer abuse, 
Jesus' attitude in this story points out to his prophetic mission of proclaiming the good news to the poor and to guide our efforts. The Synodal Church in Africa also has a prophetic mission of breaking the bonds of oppression by safeguarding and protecting women, by safeguarding the weak, among whom we have women, who are in the margins of our society by virtue of their fragility and vulnerability. It's, its first duty, the first duty of the church, is to re-examine the ways in which its own rules and systems oppress women in order to correct them. It must recognize and address the pain of women who are victims of clerical abuse. Through its members and leaders, the church must emulate Jesus' compassion by listening to the silent and sometimes overt cries of vulnerable women in order to acknowledge their suffering and contribute to their empowerment through healing and counseling. In carrying out this task, it is important to prioritize human dignity and the sacredness of life with a person-centered approach. This effort will foster care, inclusivity, and social recognition of women. The church also has to take action against oppression by denouncing injustice and challenging the oppressive forces such as cultural and religious norms that perpetuate the marginalization of women and urging this to offer redress as appropriate. It should equally raise awareness and educate its members on gender equality and against gender-based discrimination or abuse. It has to contribute towards the empowerment of African women through education, formation, and skill training. Conclusion. It is just a summary of the paper. The analysis of the narrative of Luke 13, 10 to 17 has highlighted Jesus' compassion, compassionate response to the suffering of the woman and his stand against oppressive religious, religious norms. Jesus focuses on the woman's dignity and liberates her. And the Synodal Church in Africa can emulate Jesus' attitude of giving priority to the alleviation of suffering and promotion of human dignity over the legalistic interpretation of the law. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you so much, Sister Karin. Another round of applause for that for our presentation. We are now at our last presenter for this session. She goes by the name Sister Kanza Mbaya Anastasi. She is a religious sister of the con congregation of the Benedictine nun of the Queen of the Apostles. She obtained a postgraduate diploma in education and holds a master's in biblical theology. Currently, she is a doctoral student of biblical theology at the Catholic University of Eastern Africa. She is also a member of the Women Theologians and Canonists Association of Kinshasa, African Afro-Descendant Theology Group, and Pan-African Catholic Theology and Pastoral Network. Her interests are in Africa, biblical hermeneutics, comparative theology, biblical methods and approaches, and the Bible as well as women and youth. A round of applause for Sister Kanza.
that the new people please don't mind my English. <laughs> I'll try to be clear, but uh, you will help me to improve my my text. <laughs> Uh, what I'm going to talk this afternoon is based on the literary function of female prophets in Acts 21, 8 to 15, in relationship with African prophetism, Mandona, way of stimulality. General introduction. In the light of synodality and the 40 years of the women's uh, theological involvement at Ekima University College, we need to answer two questions. The first one, how do we listen to wordless women in the Bible and the African women prophetesses? The second question is, how can we journey together in synodality? How can they please journey together in synodality? If the synodality between the female prophet in Acts 21, 8 to 15, and the African female prophet could be specified, then a synodality between Christian women and the traditional prophetism in the African context could also be clarified. I'm using the anthro socio-anthropological approach, which has three parts. The first one, the analysis of the biblical text, which mainly talk on the prophetism of the four daughters of Philip in Acts 21, 8 to 15. The second part is uh, the analysis of African prophetic reality of Mandona in DRC. And uh, finally, the, the third part is uh, the interaction of uh, the two contexts, which is brought out to help find ways of synodality by the synodal method of conversation in, of, in the spirit. The first part of uh, uh, our presentation has uh, four points. The first one is issue of female prophetism in Acts 21, 8 to 15. The second part, is the, the point is uh, the context of Acts 21, 8 to 15. The, the third point is prophecy in lifetime, and the fourth one is uh, daughter prophets. About the issue of female prophetism in Acts 21, 8 to 15, Riddle presents four swings of interpretation of Act 21, 18. The naive egalitarian, which considers Philip's daughter has proof that Luke had a vision of equality between men and women in the early church. The second stream is uh, subordination. Uh, which desires to subordinate and deny the significance of the participation of women in general and uh, the daughters of Philip in particular, which helps in uh, within the early Christianity. The third stream is uh, liberation view. Liberation view, acknowledging Luke's apparent marginalization of women in art, argues that Luke is subverting the patriarchal understandings of the role of women in early Christianity by its presentation of women in Acts. And the last one, complementary, uh, 
distinguishes between the role of the role of the office of prophet, which is limited to men, and the activity of prophesying, which can be done by, by any body. So for us, we think that without being naive, there is the question of the prophetic content in, the, in verse 9 with uh, the verb propheteusai, which is in present participle that indicates the regularity of prophetic activity of those daughters. Second point, context of Act 21, 8 to 15. The, the, the immediate context of this text is Paul's journey to Jerusalem. The large context, according to uh, Olade, he, he locates Act 21, 8 to 15 in the third part of the book of Acts, the spread of the church westward to Rome. It's chapter 13 up to 28. The third point, prophecy in lifetime. We are going to make a relationship between two, three texts. The text of Joel 3, 1 up to 4, 21, and Act 2, 17, and Act 21, 8 to 15. Joel's prophecy predicts Lord's final judgment. The text says, and it will come about after after this, that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. You see that uh, Joel is putting this, uh, uh, his uh, prophecy in the final judgment. But Luke considers Joel's prophecy has a fulfillment in the hour of spirit, the beginning of the new mission, the beginning of the change. Act chapter 2, verse 16 to 17. The text says, but this is what was spoken of, uh, spoken of through the prophet Joel, and it shall be in the last days, God, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit upon all mankind, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall bring dreams. The context has changed. And then in the, uh, Act 21 9, the prophecy becomes a state of life for the daughters of, of, of Philip. Then for him, Four daughters were virgin prophesying. The four point daughter prophet. First of all, we are giving the uh, intertextual argument. Luke knows another daughter prophet, Anna, the daughter of Manuel, of the tribe of Asher. That is the presentation of Jesus in the temple. In that text, they say that Anne was, uh, after uh, the, the, the death of her, of her husband, he remained in the temple praying, and the, when they came with Jesus, she announced about this son to the people who were there. The uh, intertextual argument of uh, the verse we are dealing with in Greek, verse 9, Tuto de esan sugateres tesares patenoi prophetusai. The daughter's virginity is the literally aspect of their prophetic permanent being. The words partenoi 
in the act of apostles is in a dominant. We find it only one time. There is not two. In and the same in the the, the, the the gospel of Luke, we find also that one one time. That means in the act of sorry, in the, the gospel of Luke, it's concerned Mary, the mother of Jesus. But in the Acts of Apostles, it concerns the four daughters of Philip. That means if we need to understand the Tartanoi in the Acts of Apostles, we have to relate it to Mary in the Gospel. And the word Sugater, daughter, Acts 2, we can find it in Acts 2, 17, and uh, Acts 21, the text we are dealing with, refers only to the daughter of Pharaoh who took care of Moses in Acts 7, verse 21. The text says, and after he had been exposed, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and nurtured him as her own son. Conclusion. By making a literary connection between the daughters of Philip and Mary on one hand, Luke recognized their prophetic, the, the, their prophetic uh, mission of purity. On the other hand, in making the connection with the daughter of Pharaoh and Anna, Luke recognizes their prophetic mission as caregiver and prayerful ladies. So now, for the second part of our presentation, we are going to talk about prophetism of Mandola in the Congo culture. In this part, I have uh, three points. The first one, prophetism in general. The second point, social political action of uh, Kim Pavita, Dona Beatrice. And uh, the second part, uh, socio-religious actions of Mandola prophetism. Prophetism, first point, prophetism in general. In, in, in the Bible, we have uh, three words to speak about prophet. prophet. We have uh, Roe, which is here. It leads to the vision. When we talk about the way is a vision. Uh, then we have uh, Rosé. It's also seer, but it is try, uh, it's stressing mostly the clairvoyance of prophecy. And then we have uh, Navi, prophet, which uh, scholars in general relate to an Akkadian cognate root meaning to call, to commission. The prophet is the one who has been called and commissioned. The second point, social political action of Kim Pavita Dona Beatrice. Kim Pavita is a prophetic female figurehead in the Congo kingdom of the 18th century. Born in 1684 in a town uh, located on Mount Kimbango. She was 22 years old when she started her prophetic mission. We have one of the representations of Kim Pavita. So she is called a prophetess for three reasons. First, Kim Pavita claimed to have received from God the mission of alleviating the suffering of her people. Then she proclaimed the imminence of the judgment of God. Finally, she had a doctrine that revolved around three axes. First, opposition to the cross and the image of Christ. Second, the idea of a black Christ and uh, the imminence of the restoration of the uh, kingdom. 
the, the, the last point for this uh, that social religious actions of McDonald's prophetism. In our early childhood in Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo, we were impressed by red women also called Mandona going around our street. They were helpers of the traditional society and thus played the role of prophet. Red cowling was applied on their skin. People approached them to learn about the future or to inquire about relationship or no current situation. Historically, the origin of Mandona has yet to be discovered. Mandona combined the honorific title, Mam, and the job title, Dona. Ma is the diminutive of Mam. In Congo, uh, we have that, uh, that culture of uh, putting the, uh, the, the family title in all the, 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 what can I say, the, the job title, the ecclesial title, even me, they call me Mama, my sir. I'm first of all Mama before being sister. Even our bishop, they are Tata, Cardinal, Tata, Monseigneur. First of all, you are Tata, you are Mama, you are Yaya. That's uh, the way of uh, uh, making us uh, in relation to our family first. Dona could be uh, delivered from the Portuguese term, Dona, which means lady. Mama Dona is at the top of the insider list. She is unique in her family. She is a plant killer. Possessed by the kinder, kinder is spirit, she reveals the diagnostic to the patient. Mandona conducts the divination session. Before starting the ceremony, she invokes the ancestors to receive full power, clairvoyance, and effectiveness from them. That is uh, the image of Mandona. Then, her prayer ends with the sign of cross. On her forehead, she binds the Ndimboa, Nyenge, a Kori shell that is supposed to give her clairvoyance the third eye. The, the patient hands her the coin symbolizing the wine. She sings religious songs before she starts to reveal the, the, the problems that are bothering her passion. She also sings ancestor, ancestor, ancestor songs. At times, she speaks in tongues and listens to the patient. Conclusion. Mandona is a prophetess in her relationship with the invisible world world. Her prophetism is a social, political, and social religious phenomenon. She is a mediator between God and human being. Mandona ensures the balance between the living and the dead. She sees in all directions, predicts the future of the clan and the, uh, and the lives of human beings. Mandona's activity can cross the political framework, as in the case of King Papita. So now, the last point of our presentation has four, four points. The female, the, 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 the title, Ways of Synodality for Female Prophetism in Africa. The, the, the first point is about female family prophets. The second one, open attitude to male prophecy difference. The third one, women's prophetism in God's plan and ascetic prophecy in uh, of uh, women. The first point, female family prophets. The female prophets are daughters of someone or mother being a biological case of love. The female prophet is 
closer to the human reality and recognizes human dignity. From this perspective of care, the voice of the Holy Spirit can be heard in the help people find on them. The second point, open attitude to male prophecy defines. Whether in Caesarea or in Africa, the woman does not close her prophetic space. If you read the text, because I didn't have time, you will see in that the, the text of uh, uh, Acts that Agabus came in the house of Philip and he prophesied on Paul in that house. And but it looks like the daughter of Philip were passive prophets, but which is not true. They are also prophets, but uh, Agabus uh, uh, did spoke something in their house. To be open to the difference in gender is a sign of fearlessness and trust in the difference. The Holy Spirit work in diversity to empower each one in his or a difference. Women's prophetism in God's plan. The prophetism of the daughter of Philip is in God's plan for realizing the common prophetism by the poor reign of spirit. Also, the healing ministry of Mandona and her identity struggle in the social, political, and cultural area is also divine. The last point, ascetic prophecy of women. The four daughters of Caesarea are virgins. Mandona's practice is always linked to specific dietary prohibition to favor the success of the prophetic act. The ascetic aspect dignify human beings. Philip and uh, his daughters are dignified by the daughter's virginity, whether ascetic act of African prophetess dignifies their client. Conclusion. Philip's daughters and Mandona can journey can work in synodality, not only because of what they have in common but also because of the possibility to interweave the thoughts and feelings of their context about their identity and social cultural role. Women Christian can work together with the, the women healers of the African culture. In fact, these healers have dignity the voice of the Holy Spirit can be heard from them. Jesus has high, high regard from them, and the church should listen to them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mama, Sister, Kanda. <laughs> and I think you don't agree with me that her English is impeccable. Yes. Uh, so we have had our three presenters. We are going to the next session, which is the interactive session. But I know we have been sitting for over an hour. So we are going to have, because of limitation of time, just three minutes to ensure your legs are still working. <laughs> Meanwhile, I will call the three presenters to please come at the front for the interactive session. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do that. I'm not sure if I'm
and as a teacher. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was very good. That my question, just a short question to uh, Sister Karim. Um, why do you see the second encounter, the encounter with uh, the synagogue leader is the main plot? Why do you qualify that one as the main plot? Whereas your title is uh, the healing of the people of women. Yes, um, my name is Caroline. My question also goes to uh, Karen. I just want to first of all congratulate you for a good analysis of your text using the narrative approach. I just want clarification, uh, especially when you are making the part of application or something that you call it clearly. Uh, what would you say is the role of women, African, Georgians, like the Muslim sitting here, uh, with relation to your text? Also, what would you say is the role of the oppressed women or the women who seem to be rippled towards their own liberation? My question goes to the first presenter, Sister Andrew. Now, bearing in mind what we have been discussing for the past few days, now, can you really classify religious women among those who are the territories? Okay, I have a question. Yes. Um, first to Sister Karin, thanks very much for that beautiful presentation. I think the diptych structure gives us a um, the opportunity for interpretation of what of the text. And it would seem to me that if you've identified the second part as the main plot, that um, the strong issue uh, or what I would like to call the double event might be highlighting the double trouble of the vulnerable, the physical and then the issue of the understanding and interpretation of the Sabbath law. It would seem to me that that is where the heart of the issue, that legality is used to keep a bound woman bound. So Jesus is not just losing the woman, but is losing the interpretation of that Sabbath law. Um, I don't know your take on that in terms of the, the big structure you identified. And to Sister Karen, um, Kanza, thank you very much for the beautiful um, just a position of the scripture text and um, the Mama uh, Amandra. It worries me, however, that the link between Mary's virginity and the four daughters, is it sufficient to make a link between prophet's sin and purity? I was wondering if it was too his a um, link for the argument. And I'm also worried that the four daughters say no word, do no action in the text you chose. And it would take a male prophet from elsewhere, Agabus, to come and reveal something to Paul, who is living with the four daughters who are prophets. And um, it, it makes me wonder um, your choice for this text as just opposing the text, the cultural event. Could they borrow the prophetess or a prophetess in the Old Testament? who is more active, dynamic, participating in the community, have delivered a stronger persuasion for this argument. Well, 
part of food for my English and, and it put to be the speaker. I'm learning English now. So <laughs> I am uh, very grateful for the two presentations, but my question is for sister, ma, 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 mama sister. <laughs> <laughs> the first one is that uh, she did say, where Kim Parita was from. That's very important for me. Uh, the second one is that this man, Mama Donna movement, spiritual movement, I think, uh, it is this Christian movement, syncretic movement, and uh, it, not, it, it is not a Christian. Uh, how to establish a bridge of a dialogue? How are you appointing this movement as paradigm of, of a women Christian prophecy? Thank you. I, can you understand my English? Yes. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much to our presenters, our wonderful presentations. Uh, really to see how powerfully you are able to get into the scripture and remind, I think many of us are not in the biblical uh, field to go back and take it seriously. Uh, mine is to Audrey Mwale. It's first of all, actually, a, a really a comment. When we speak of uh, periphery, I'm wondering whether, what we really mean. Uh, in today's world, uh, because we are assuming that there is something like a center somewhere, which seems to be superior than the periphery in today's world. Uh, maybe every place is a periphery or a center, if you like. What would be your comment on this? So periphery versus uh, versus center, and uh, in in. Post-colonial studies, uh, sometimes center can mean uh, maybe the north or south, uh, but is that an approach we should take? So that's one. But then the comment, uh, uh, you did uh, come back to St. Bakita, St. Monica, just as a way of a comment, here at Boston, uh, at the Kima University College, we actually have named our auditorium under St. Bakita. Just uh, so that people know, if you pass around, you will see that uh, she's name in our auditorium is uh, named under Pakita. Uh, thank you very much. We have one question online. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much to all presenters. My name is Elias Opongo. I teach at the Peace Institute. Um, to Sister Mwale, um, and maybe any of the presenters could also uh, give a feedback. Thank you for highlighting the role of women uh, in the Bible. Uh, but while it's important to acknowledge their heroic um, uh, presence and work in the Bible, I think it's also important to highlight the uh, the cultural and political struggles that they went through. They were people of their culture. Um, they had to struggle through uh, to create spaces and negotiate that space uh, within very oppressive cultures. Uh, we also acknowledge that there were other women and men that lifted them to, to be what they are today uh, to us. Uh, so how, how, how do we in the church today negotiate uh, for more women agency, um, especially when we seek to contextualize religious life uh, to our African social cultural context. Uh, we may very much want to be listened to, uh, but religious formation, I, I think, also needs to have this conversation of contextualization. Um, and also our pastoral response, so that we are addressing the current needs of the church. Uh, there were very controversial issues around um, how do we accompany people who've been rejected in the church. There were talks about homosexuals, lesbians, I've encountered that in my own pastoral work in, in secondary schools here in Kenya. 
um, how can we make our our theological language uh, much more common to uh, a regular Christian uh, in our society today? So, in other words, I'm just saying that uh, I like the the way the presentations have been contextualized, and maybe this is an invitation uh, to see where social sciences maybe can uh, come in, so that when we we talk theology, we are also talking uh, experiences of what we have. Uh, harvested from from the people on the ground that we've been able to uh, to research in our parishes, in our schools, uh, in in our own convents, um, and I've interacted with some of the uh, colleagues who've done some research in uh, religious formation in Africa, uh, and sometimes we get information that we cannot really divulge uh, out there because maybe they were too embarrassed to to bring it out, or maybe we want a certain image of the church um, that other lay people uh, are willing to accept. Uh, so I'm just uh, kind of an invitation to contextualization and, and how do we get deeper into that conversation. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you very much for the wonderful presentation. My question goes to Sister Karen. Um, you talked about um, the expression total environment. And it seems to me that that uh, expression appears only here in Luke among the four Gospels. But again, to just oppose it, with Jesus being called son of Abraham, and Jesus himself in the same Gospel of Luke, chapter 19, calling Zacchaeus son of Abraham. What would be the implication of that to, you know, inclusivity of everyone in the church? <laughs> Thank you. There's one question on the chat from Benlinda Kuzi. So she says, my question goes to Sister Karin. Firstly, what can we learn from the crippled woman or take along as we move forward as women? Secondly, I just seek clarification if you can explain further as to why Jesus gave the woman a name or rather identifying her as the daughter of Abraham while he calls the man in the synagogue a hypocrite. No questions? So we'll start with Sister Karin and then we'll move. Thank you for the question. I have, I think, four questions, but some. Uh, look alike or they complement each other. So the first question, why I say the second encounter is the main plot, whereas it is the healing of the crippled woman. I think elements of responses coming from the comments Father made a while ago, and I agree with him, when he says the diptych structure could be the, the main plot because the issues that come out at, uh, in the first plot, in what I call the subplot, they are addressed and amplified in the second plot. I talk of the macro structure with two intertwined plots because the story of the healing of the woman could stand on its own. But what makes this story peculiar is the fact that after the healing, there is a reaction and it is through this reaction that Jesus deepens the meaning of his own action. He heals the woman. It could go unnoticed if the synagogue leader had not intervened to say that Jesus wasn't supposed to heal on the Sabbath. Even though he doesn't say Jesus wasn't supposed to heal, he spoke to the crowd. But when Jesus talks, he says, he talks 
talks about freeing the woman from a bond. Her healing is a form of liberation. And this will bring us to the daughter of Abraham. When Jesus uh, talks about the actions of the leader and the other opponents, he portrays that they are saying that he should not heal the woman. The woman cannot walk, doesn't have to be done on the Sabbath because you have a law that prohibits work. But Jesus shows them that they are working on the Sabbath. Each time they untie their animals to bring them for a drink, it is a form of work. And in this text, he actually shows the importance or the dignity of the woman when he calls her a daughter of Abraham, like anybody who deserves. Being. I don't say animals don't need to be cared for with uh, the environmental no, but who is the superior being here? The woman is created in the image of God and she deserves to be healed because she is created in God's image. She is loved for who she is, but the leader doesn't see this aspect of the dignity of the woman. And here I will come to Father Stephen's own question when he asks, it's true. Jesus is the son of Abraham. He's a descendant of Abraham also. We have Zacchaeus, who is called the son of Abraham. If you look at the two contexts, the woman and Zacchaeus, they are people who are on the margins. The society looks at them as, I would put, the, the outcasts, the lowly ones. They don't have importance. They don't have a place. And Jesus gives them the importance they deserve because they are all created in the image of God. And Jesus is the first, he is the son of God himself. So we are co-heirs with Jesus. So is the woman and so is Zacchaeus. I, and then there is another question which I did not touch since I don't, I don't remember the name. And there is an aspect of your question I missed. Talking about the application what is the role of African women theologians in relation to this text? I think that the African women theologians are part of the church. We said we are not uh, making a distinction. In synodality, we are working together as a church. So when we talk of the church and its members, I think those who are more enlightened can help the others. And just as all other Christians, we are called to be able to listen to the voices of those who are struggling, to be able to respond uh, to alleviate pain, to be able to help towards healing and liberation and integrating those who are at the margins of our society. Father spoke about the periphery. I'm not answering that question, but there are many people in the existential peripheries it mustn't be geographical. People whose value is not recognized. So theologians are there maybe to be the voice of the voiceless, men and women alike. But I think women would respond with more sensi sensitivity to the needs of women because I think they can feel more. There is this empathy that goes with it. A woman can understand, I believe, another woman's pain better than a man. So for that, the questions that we asked in the room, those are the, the answers I could give. And from online, I was asked, what can we learn from the daughter of Abraham? I think that is what was said. Well, this daughter in the text, I would say she's passive. She's the woman who doesn't have a voice, but I think she cooperates. When Jesus calls her, she moves towards him, she gets the healing, and she praises God. Her only action that we see is the praise, but she collaborates, she moves towards Jesus, she accepts the healing, and she, she straightens up. She's no longer bent over. So what I believe is the openness to receive what God has to offer 
and also to be hopeful because there is no case that would not have a solution in God. And that when we have received whatever God gives us, that we can also turn back to him in thanksgiving and praise. And also through after our own healing, that we may be able to empower others. Thank you. Um, if I'm to respond to the questions that were given, I think uh, partly Sister Karina has answered in terms of uh, peripheries. I borrowed, it's only that I was cheating, if you saw, but I borrowed the definition of the Holy Father and the Synod uh, experts uh, because they keep on talking about these peripheries. And the word is used uh, interchangeably in some cases with those on the margins, those at the edge, you know, such kind of uh, So it, it doesn't mean geographical, as uh, she has said, but um, those who are in need, the poor, the mentally disturbed. Even now, coming to the first question of classifying religious women among those at the peripheries, I didn't understand correctly. But uh, if you understand in terms of this definition of not geographical, but any person who is in need, not center really, but uh, the those that are in need, then uh, they can also be classified in the same uh, group. Um, talking of uh, uh, the last question that I, re I got from Father. Um, I think, um, uh, we need to uh, talk more about um, these issues, uh, even uh, like I gave the example of our situation in Zambia to say theology, mostly it is for priests and not for any other person. There's only the, seminar, the seminaries that are offering the theology. And meaning that if the people would want to, to study theology, they have to go outside, thank God Hekima is offering this uh, one year uh, or some some, uh, uh, some theology online that sisters are doing a, a bit of this. Now imagine they tell us that sisters, we are really blunt uh, about theology, even when they see you are religious, but they know that you have no much exposure to theology. You would hear even people using wrong Hebrew, you know, because of this uh, exposure to my uh, uh, scripture, I have learned in passing how to read Hebrew, uh, Greek. But, you know, the seminarians or the young priests will take it that we are all ignorant, so they will be using this and then I'll be smiling to myself. Mm -hmm. So what I can encourage uh, Father is just uh, that we, continue uh, uh, teaching uh, uh, the little that we know in theology and about the women itself and their, uh, they themselves and their identity to those that are in the formation, even the lay people that will need this theology to intensify with the, 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 the exposure to theology. That's my comment. Thank you very much. I received two questions, but divided each of them. Uh, the first one has uh, two aspects. Uh, Father asked, how, do, how have I relate uh, prophetism and purity from the word virginity? Yes. Uh, thank you for your, your question. You know, in reading the text, we don't, the, the biblical text, we don't uh, look for the, what, what can I say, like uh, Luke had to say uh, here, virginity is uh, purity. No, it's me from my reading. Uh, the, the, the analysis, uh, what can I say, literally analysis of the text, Bring me brings me in the intertextuality of the text. You have to, have to, to read the text inside 
and outside of. So when I know that Luke is uh, the author up to now, we know that Luke is the author of Acts of Apostles and the, uh, the, the, the Gospel of Luke. And then in doing my semantic analysis, when I discover that this word is an apart legomenon, is a very great finder. Then, then I go in uh, the gospel, I find that this word is again an apart legomenon. Structurally, I have to understand that the order is putting together those, those uh, ladies. I don't know, maybe the word uh, used, purity, uh, is a, 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 an issue, but I think for me, I, 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 I thought it was that one for a uh, look needed to tell us. In, sorry, Father, yes? I would link your link between the purity and prophet. Yes. Um, is it sufficient that there is another? I can, yes, I can wider it, but uh, for, for now, uh, that's what I, 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 I found. I can wider it because of time and also, you know, this paper had uh, limited words. I would not go further, but I can do it. Uh, your, the second aspect of your question was, uh, why not Deborah, who is active and dynamic, instead of uh, uh, those four daughters who are not speaking? Yes, I choose I have choose them. Huh? That is English, I think. I choose them <laughs> because because of that they are not speaking, and people are saying many things for them without going deeper. They are not, it is, it is kind of apparent marginalization, but they are not marginalized. We have to go deeper to understand which kind of prophet they are. Now, for the second question, um, uh, 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 Professor Bonifacio, uh, your question has uh, three orientations. Uh, the first orientation you say, uh, how to relate prophetism and the purity? No, no, sorry. Where Kimba Vita, uh, where Kim, Kimba Vita is from? Kimba Vita is from uh, Congo, center cent, cent, of Congo, Congo Central. And uh, she, she is from uh, a Congo Kingdom. Congo Kingdom was taking um, Kinshasa. Congo Brazzaville and your country, Angola. So <laughs> she is also from your country. Yes. And then you have asked also, how can Mandona be a paradigm for a paradigm for African women? I think uh, from the good they do in the society. They are paradigm. We don't look at them well. We look at them like witchcraft, like, no, they are ladies for our society and uh, they, they are needed. We need them. If we, if we need to understand our culture, we can't avoid them. Like uh, uh, Father uh, Marcel was saying, uh, uh, the first day, who is missing at the table? Those ladies are missing. We have to listen to them. They will help us. And uh, the third aspect of your question is, is, uh, is the movement of a Mandona Christian of uh, uh, traditional. Uh, is a traditional movement, but Congo Kingdom today uh, centers of Congo, they have a Christian culture. Their culture is mixed with Christianity. You can't now separate it. Thank you.
Okay, we are we are running behind time. So I think we are going to close this session this session at this point. I also have an announcement that because of the delay that this session has had, our next session will start at 4 30 instead of 4. So uh, those who will be going to rest. Just to notify you that the driver will pick you from Rosa Mystica at 4 p.m. So be ready at that time. Now we'll be breaking for lunch. And I would like one of our sisters who can volunteer to pray for our meal and um, to wish you all a good afternoon. Okay. So who can volunteer, sister? Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank you. Let's arise for the prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Father, we want to thank you for this morning session that is coming to a close. We thank you for all that we are. Uh, right to us, the new uh, horizons that have been opened before us, the new things we have learned today, we beg you, Lord, uh, to continue to clarify our minds and grant us also open our minds to the grace to be able to implement all that we are learning here and bring them into real life action to the greater glory of your name. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. And we ask you to bless our meal that we are going to take this afternoon as we stay together. Bless us, O oh Lord, and, and this is your peace which we are about to receive from your peace. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bon appetit. Amen. Just to make it real easy for those who are going to Rosa Mystica to have some rest. Uh, let, let's say we are now going for lunch, and by 2.40, the bus will be leaving. So if you are not going by 2.40, then you are here. So it makes it easy for others. 2.40, the bus will leave. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.